Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin and this is video number five in my new series, An Introduction to Freediving and Spearfishing California. Today, we're headed back to Northern California. I'm gonna show you how to dive for Dungeness Crab for a nice little catch and cook. But first, I wanna show you how I set up my dive board. If you're a returning viewer, you've seen me use this dive board over and over again for catches of scallops, crab, sea urchin, fish. I use it to carry my gear, and I even use it to cruise over the top of rocky and otherwise dangerous reef. But today I want to start by showing you how to set up a board just like this. The materials you're going to need. You need a body board, what we refer to as a goodie bag. You also want to get some of these, these little bungees. They come in a pack of eight. I think they're about 15 bucks. You're only gonna need four, so just do this with a friend. You can both set up your boards at the same time. And then uh, I'm also gonna use some bank line. It can be any type of line, it doesn't really matter. Just some kind of tough nylon cordage. When you get your body board, make sure you get a hard bottom body board. That is key. All right, so the very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop this little plastic piece out. It screws together on both sides like this. And I wanna flip it around so that the leash is actually attached to the bottom of the board. If it's attached to the top of the board, what happens is your board's cruising along through the water behind you and every time you're, you're pulling on it, it's wanting to push down the nose of the board into the water and eventually it'll flip over. And when it does, now you've got this curvature that's constantly digging into the water. So you're pulling around a bunch of dead weight. So if you put it underneath, it'll just glide along the surface. So we're gonna flip this thing around. So now it's attached. Just gonna come through here, screw this piece in on the other side. You can do this entire thing in your apartment even if you don't have power tools or anything like that. Nobody's gonna be yelling at you for making noise. All right, so now our leash attachment is down here. I'm gonna attach that leash. Okay, that's it for the leash. Now we've got a body board with a leash on backwards. <laughs> Let's make this into a dive board. This one's got a little lock up here that you flip allows you to open it, put it back together, slip that thing back over, and it locks it. And that's important because if you throw an octopus in here, it's going to do everything it can to get out. Dungeness crab are the same. They're always trying to get out, so you need a lock on your bag. The first thing I'm going to do is just punch two holes in the top here, and I'm going to run a piece of this cordage through it. My bag's got this cool little extra handle here, so I'm going to tie it off to this extra handle here. Because you can just push this uh, screwdriver right through the board. What will happen is you'll hit the hard bottom and when you do you can push a little bit into it and it'll create a little bump and then you can find it very easily on the other side and finish by pushing through the hard part back toward the top of the board. There's a little bump right there. So I got one bump here now I got one bump right here and then I'll flip it over and I'll finish these from this side now that I know where those bumps are. That's it. No drill required. Super easy. I love how user friendly this whole process is. Boom. Just a screwdriver. And None of the knots are going to be crazy on this. A lot of just basic overhand stuff. So this one's a little stuck in here. If that happens, you can just take your screwdriver and widen out that hole a little bit. Oftentimes it'll grab the, the cord itself and it'll actually pull it through. My board has this extra attachment here, so I'm going to attach to that. If it doesn't have the extra attachment, just make sure you open it. And that way you can tie to one handle and you don't tie both together, otherwise you'll never be able to open it again. Very simple overhand knot. Pull it in tight. So it looks like that. And I'll just do one more for good measure. So it'll look like that. But now, 
you can see this thing is not really attached. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a couple of points here and here and then down lower on the board here and here and I'm going to do the exact same thing I just did up here but just to anchor little bits of this bag to keep it stuck to the board. Now one thing I want to keep in mind when I'm doing this is I want extra room on the sides because I'm going to put those bungees in here so I can put my spear gun and my pole spear on the sides. So I've got it anchored now. One thing I will say is when you're punching these holes, try to keep the, like a distance of about an inch at least between those holes. Otherwise, this could, you know, tear through or something like that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my bungees on the side so I can put my spear gun and my pole spear. So first I'll punch a hole, then I'll put the screwdriver into the bungee like that and I'll push it on through. And again, it's just two holes side by side. We're going to do one up here, one down here. And I'm not measuring anything here. Um, some people are really, really meticulous. If you, you know, are that kind of person, you need to measure everything. That's completely fine. But I just want to show you that like, you could put this thing together in an hour with no measurements and do it in your apartment. I'm going to put the bungee on the end of the uh, screwdriver there and I'm going to push it through. This may take a couple of times, sometimes it'll slip off as it's going through, but I don't know if you can see this. This time it completely worked. Now I'm going to pull this, flip it over, I've got my second hole right here, so I'm just going to push it right back through, same thing. And now I've got our bungee right in here. Now I think these bungees come um, a little bit longer than what you actually want. So what I typically do is I'll actually pull out some of the slack. I'll tie a new knot in here and that makes it a little bit smaller and that way it's a little tighter on my spear gun when it's sitting on there because I want that thing really tight, really holding that spear gun there. I do not want to lose my spear gun. So I've just released the little knot here from this little blue bead and I'm just going to make another overhand knot same knot I've been using for everything in this and I'm just going to pull it tight very very tight and now I'm going to trim off the extra there and that's going to make that bungee way way tighter for holding my spear gun so that's what it looks like and then this goes like that over your spear gun. Very simple. So now I'm gonna do three more of those. That's it. So we got two spots here and here. So we can put our guns on there and our pole spear over here. Got our goodie bag, it's all stuck on there. Pitbull Tackle sent me this awesome stringer. So I might throw that up on here as well. Uh, a lot of times I just put my, my game right in my goodie bag here, but it's always nice to have a string or two in case you decide like you really want to get a whole bunch of huge red sea urchins or you've packed this thing full of Dungeness crab, then you can throw your fish on here. Last thing you can do is actually uh, put a dive flag on it. I might do that as well. But in any case, this video is not a how to rig up your dive board uh, kind of video. Instead, this is just part of it. So let's go free diving. So here you can see I'm using my bodyboard to kick out through the surf. I'm doing what is called duck diving. I push the nose of the board down and then I just cruise underneath the white water until I get out past the breaking waves. I'm dropping the salmon head down here tied to a rock tied to the end of this string and on the other end of the string I've got a water bottle as a float. And this is bait to attract crab. Here you can see me roping off my float line to the end of the leash on the bodyboard. That way I can have the bodyboard just trail behind me. On the other end of the leash I have a pry bar which I'm using as a weight today and I've got my crab gauge. Here you can see that salmon head where I dropped it actually ended up in a cobbly bottom area. And we don't want to be in those cobbles. We don't want to be anywhere around rocks because that's where rock crab live and that's where Dungeness crab do not live. So I picked up the salmon head and I moved it to a new location. That's tip number one. If you want Dungeness, you've got to be over sand. 
Sometimes the crab are way out deep. A lot of times you'll find good legal crab in shallow. That's why you can get them with a crab snare from shore. So this is a dungy and it's half submerged in the sand. So I have to dig it up to see if it's a male or female and you can see it's holding eggs. So this is a female and a pregnant female. Uh, none of us keep pregnant females and I only keep females uh, on occasion if there is no male around. If you're in Oregon, keeping females is completely prohibited. This was kind of cool. There was just a huge school of bait fish down here. Um, I'm not sure what species they are, maybe sardines. Um, but yeah, they were just so, so thick. Usually when you see that, that can be a good indicator if the temperature is right, that there might be predator fish like halibut around as well. So you see me keep digging these females out of the sand. Um, it's not that the females are the only ones that will be under the sand. That's why I keep doing this. Matter of fact, a lot of times when I dig a crab out of the sand, it is a male. But this particular day, the more that I was digging them out of the sand, the more I was finding that they were all pregnant females, all females sitting on eggs. After digging like 10 of these out of the sand and seeing that they were pregnant females, um, I decided to start looking around to see if there were any free moving crab, any that were still walking around. Uh, my theory being that those that were buried on this particular day were all females with eggs and those that might be moving around more freely might be the males. So I found the shipwreck. This was pretty cool. Um, sometimes what happens is you'll find a big patch of sand and then in the sand will be a little bit of structure like a rock or in this case a shipwreck and around the edges of that little bit of structure you will find a few crab. And right here I find my first male Dungeness crab and he's out walking around. But I gauged him. I thought he was going to be legal. He was about an eighth of an inch under so I dropped him and uh, let him go back and kept looking. And you can see there's just so many Dungeness all over the bottom here. And sometimes, like this one, you can barely see the edge of the carapace. They bury themselves down so only their eyes are showing. And like I said, sometimes these, these crab that are buried are males. So this is important to look for. When you dive down, you're not always going to see crab just walking around. You want to look for those very subtle details in the sand because sometimes digging them out of the sand is, is what is required to, uh, to get those legal male dungies. So I kept swimming around. Um, it was relatively murky and off in the distance I saw this guy and he starts moving quick and <laughs> I had to kind of coax him into my hand here. You want to grab the back two legs, that way they can't get you. I flip them over and you can see that pointed apron, that's clearly a male. And so I grab the, uh, the gauge here. You can see one of his claws was broken off and starting to regrow, so it's kind of small. But uh, when I go to gauge him, that's at least a six inch legal male Dungeness crab. So I've got one and uh, we've got no skunk. That's what I'm talking about. What a beauty. They're so cool. I, I love these crab. Taste great and, and they're just, they look awesome. So here's me using the board. Um, slipping it into that bag quickly and then using that lock to make sure that that crab cannot get away. And like I said in my last video, um, I like to keep a little bit, oh yeah, I've got holes in my, my glove. I like to keep a, a little bit of slack on my float line and uh, that allows me to keep the weight at the bottom of the float line from dragging all over the place. So in this case, I found a legal male Dungeness and so I want to keep that weight on the bottom so that I can keep maintaining that position. So I could drop back down and scan the area around where I found the last one and maybe if all the females are clumped up in, in the sand together, maybe the males are all hanging out together too. You never know. This is just a hypothesis at this point, but that's why I'm hanging out here breathing up. So now I take my deep breath and dive back down to the bottom. And again, you can see I, I keep my gauge and my pry bar together. That pry bar on a Dungeness dive could be anything. You could have a, you know one pound lead weight or two pound lead weight or something, but it's just a marker. I'm seeing more females. There's a lot of time spent what we call beating the sand. This is the same process if you're hunting halibut. You spend a lot of time over sand on some days, and then some days it's very productive very quickly. This is a big female. She would have been a legal size and she didn't have eggs, so of all the females I saw that day, that would be the one that I would keep if I was going to keep one, but I did let her go because I did already have one male, so um, I'm going to keep looking for males. Some more bait fish. Super cool. And you just see all these crap. There's another female. There's another female. They're all buried in. 
And uh, it's just kind of cool to, to see that there's that much abundance of Dungeness crab, um, even if there's not a lot of males on this particular day. And it is not always like this. So I'm looking off in the distance and I'm trying to see if I see any light color and here I see some claws and I think, oh, that could very well be a male, especially since he starts to run away when I get close and for sure it is another male. So again, grabbing those back legs so he can't pinch me, got my gauge and you got to measure between the points at the widest point on the, uh, the carapace there and this is another legal Dungeness. So now I've got two in the bag. Quickly put it in there, quickly lock that bag again, and now I can forget about it. And I really like that. I've got all this gear on my board and it just trails behind me so I can completely forget about it while I'm diving. So at this point I grabbed a crab snare out, loaded it up with bait, and I wanted to drop down and put this in front of a crab on the bottom because I was wondering if I was crab snaring on a day like this, would I think, oh, this area has no crab because the crabs are not feeding, or would I put this in front of a crab and it would come right out of the sand and grab it and devour it? So if you're ever casting out and you're wondering if there's any crab out there or maybe thinking that there's none, look at this. This crab does not even care. There's two of them here. They don't even care. Oh yeah, check this out. I think this is a sand dab. It, it could be a, a juvenile halibut, but I think it's a sand dab. Just absolutely beautiful perfect example of evolution by natural selection. I mean, look at how well that blends in. That keeps them from being preyed upon by seals and larger fish, but it also allows them to be ambush predators so that when another fish that's smaller comes by, they can just, boom, come up off the bottom and grab them. And uh, these guys were certainly attracted by the scent and uh, in their nibbling on the crab snare. So I dropped down five minutes later to see if I left them alone, if those crabs would do anything, and the crabs had just buried themselves even deeper. The only thing that was even interested in it seemed to be these little flat fish. They are seriously so, so cool. So anyway, I picked up the snare again. Um, just an example for you. If you're throwing snares and you're not catching anything, it does not mean that the bottom is not covered with crab. It just could be one of those days where they're not feeding for whatever reason. So finally, toward the end of the dive, I came back to those uh, carcasses that I had tied to weights at the bottom. And sure enough, at the bottom, munching on one of those carcasses was another male Dungeness crab. I was super stoked on this. Usually when I come back to these carcasses, there'll be like five, but today was kind of slow. So, um, yeah, when I gauged it, I was like, oh man, we got three legals and it's actually a 16th of an inch short. I mean, it is barely short. We, what we call a clicker and I don't keep clickers. So bye bye, buddy. You get to live another day. <laughs> Maybe one of you will catch this in about a month and it'll be legal. Oh yeah, and then on the way in, I found a freaking GoPro. Yeah, how's that for a wasteland uh, find? GoPro on the end of a selfie stick. If you lost this, leave a comment. Don't say where it was. You can DM me with the uh, exact location and I'll send it back to you. But yeah, in the end, got a couple of legal dungies, some great footage, I think, and uh, a really cool dive. What a great time diving. Well, only two today. Um, that was crazy. I probably saw 200 or more females with eggs out there. Um, that's awesome. It's actually really great to see. That means that our fishery is totally sustainable because all of those females are about to reproduce. But of course, we're only taking males and I only saw two, but I talked with a guy out there who was a kayak angler, kayak crabber, and he said that last week he filled up on males in two traps. So it looks like all the males were in shallow, everything was kind of murky. As soon as it calmed down and cleaned up and it was good for me to go diving, all the males made their way out deeper and all the females stayed to incubate their eggs. All good, we got two. So uh, let's go cook something delicious. Also, I think this is gonna be probably one of maybe two or three Dungeness dives because I wanna show you what it looks like when all those females are actually legal males. On the way home, I stopped and foraged some wild three-corner leek. It's an invasive leek. And then I stopped and foraged a nice little cluster of wild oyster mushrooms. You can see the abundance in this clip here with a little dime there in the middle for scale.
there it is. Crab melt. Mmm. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Alright, I'm gonna finish this now, but <clears throat> I hope you learned a few things about freediving for Dungeness Crab in this episode. And until next time, keep the old ways alive. In my next introduction to freediving and spearfishing video, I'm gonna show you how to add a dive flag to this float for diving around jetties. I'm also going to go diving for these guys. I'm not talking about those perch, and I'm not talking about that clam. I'm talking about sustainable and amazing two-spot octopus in Southern California. And before you say, how could you go for an octopus? Remember, if you were the size of that clam, he would eat you. In the meantime, if you'd like to come out and learn how to poke pole and do some intertidal foraging, I'm teaching folks how to go for sea urchin, how to go for mussels, how to go for eels, etc. And we finish off that foraging with a nice little shellfish boil. Come join <laughs> Kevin and get some coastal foraging on, some fresh urchin, some mussel. Beautiful day, amazing time. I hope you learned something in this episode. I hope you... I ho blah, blah, blah. Please don't buy this float line. <laughs> I should know better by now, but yeah, just avoid the hassle. Don't buy this float line. <laughs>